our second keynote speaker for the conference is already here online. That's uh, Professor Ian Thompson. So I think we'll, uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll um, I'll introduce Ian um, so as we can and he can get on with the uh, <clears throat> sorry with his address. Um, just to to put this in a bit of context, and I, I, I thought of doing a long. Uh, 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 introduction to to Ian covering his uh, uh, his career and so on but of course then remember that actually this is uh, uh, what we actually did um, last year when Ian received the distinguished academic award uh, for BAFA this is an annual award given to one academic uh, each year uh, and one of the I suppose I don't know whether Ian would consider this a benefit, a perk, or whether it was a, a chore or responsibility, is to then have it the following year, you then get the opportunity to uh, deliver a keynote address to the, the whole conference. Uh, Ian currently is the director of Lloyd's Banking uh, Group Centre for Responsible Business at the University of, of Birmingham, where he's also a professor of accounting. Uh, he's the um, uh, I think he's still the convener of the Centre for Social yeah. and uh, Environmental Accounting Research as well. Um, uh, and uh, he will be addressing us today on one of the, one of the big challenges facing uh, humanity and the planet in relation to our, our attitudes and how we will approach. Uh, carbon emissions. Ian's uh, address is going to be, uh, or is entitled, Net Zero Carbon Accountability, Our Last Best Chance. So without further ado, uh, over to you, Ian, um, to talk to us on that title. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it's always a little bit tri tricky doing, uh, <laughs> doing things remotely, um, and I'm clicking a button and nothing's happening. But I'm calm as I speak. I'd, I'd just like to kind of to start off by I think thanking um, thanking Bafa for this for this opportunity, and and mega praise on actually getting getting us kind of this far at this kind of this this point in time, having organised a couple of virtual conferences. It's very much a proverbial swan elegantly swimming across the lake, but with like the legs battering away like nothing under un, under underneath and uh, the the more <laughs> the smoother it looks the the, the better um, it's also it's also a great honor uh, to be, to have been awarded um, the sort of distinguished academic of the year it's, it's something which uh, still I still kind of pinch myself at at, uh, at times <laughs> to sort of like go yeah you're doing the plenary at Baffa Ian uh, and I, remembering kind of like, you know, about 25 ones when I'm sitting in the audience looking, these people are really clever. These are people are really impressive and uh, the, the pressure really, really is on. But what, I, what I'd, like to, I'd like to do in, in, this, in this presentation is, is very much kind of outline um, some of the kind of issues to do with with climate change, which, as, as Stuart kind of like pointed out, is very much the you know kind of the the concern that we that we have just now that we're kind of that we're all facing. It's a genuine global problem where there is there's there is no no real hiding places, and some places are better hiding hiding places than than, than others. And it, it's it's in just re reflecting on the role of kind of accounting in in relation to, to climate change. I mean, just a little bit. This this in, this thing started when I was sitting kind of slightly, slightly smugly listening to um, Greta Thunberg and some of the protests and going, "Yeah, I do climate change. I'm okay. I've I've done all these different different things." Yet when it kind of when it when it came down to it, and it was like this. What are you doing for us? This kind of this this challenge that was that was that was placed upon the kind of like the if you like the the citizens of the world by many of the children of the world. I then started to reflect on well, what is it that we're actually doing that that's trying to make a difference? And and in in many ways it then triggered a, a, a chain a chain of action and research projects and initiatives which I, I want to kind of say. To talk about today, but 
I'll, I'll just kind of start off with, in some ways with a, a little bit of a provocation in terms of it really seems that the prudence concept so dear to financial reporting doesn't apply to existential threats. It just applies to some, some little threats. I mean, how catastrophic does a risk have to be before it's considered material by accountants? And how certain does a future event have to be before it moves from off balance sheet to contingency, to provision, to unavoidable cost? Given the materiality and certainty of impairment on so many assets from our current climate emergency, perhaps it's time to anticipate a few losses. The prosperity enjoyed by a minority of, the human, of humans has been financed by social exploitation and carbon emissions. Yet despite decades of scientific evidence and observable changes in our life experience that forewarn of catastrophic change, collectively our discipline and associated profession has done very little. I would argue that institutions are walking into climate chaos with their climate senses off with alarmingly low levels of, of carbon literacy. Yet, so many of the climate change solutions are dependent on accounting, finance, assurance, and taxation. When we actually look at many of the things that other people are proposing, accountancy and finance is at the center of these actions, either as providing essential evidence or as actual levers of change. But we tend to, I, I'm not quite sure why we're so reticent to act when we have potentially so much to offer and people are wanting us to offer them. Right now, I feel we're, uh, we're effectively ceding a critical field to others without our collective expertise who are discovering new problems like double counting, entity, consolidation issues, valuation, assurance, without the underlying knowledge set to resolve them. These, those people don't always have the capacity or infrastructure to deliver anything like the quality of evidence that could be provided if we combine the best, best available climate science, best available low carbon technologies, carbon governance, and the best carbon accounting kind of practices. In, in many ways, the development of carbon bookkeeping, accounting, reporting, and insurance is nowhere near what is required to deal with the knowable risks we're facing now, let alone the many unknown risks. More worryingly, research suggests that flaws in the most common carbon accounting techniques may actually increase carbon emissions rather than reduce them. We are attempting to address a 21st century problem with the equivalent of 16th century merchants' cash, cash books. There is a real urgency to move beyond individual efforts of key, of key, kind of like, um, key researchers and practitioners to add to the momentum building and practice to co-create a carbon accountability fit for purpose. So this presentation will take stock of the current state of carbon accountability report on some, some uh, research projects, engagement activities, and climate change educational initiatives. It is intended to provoke, uh, provoke and try and inspire you to action to ensure that accounting fulfills its potential in preventing climate change and promoting climate justice. It will argue for a recoupling of climate consequences with all social and economic activities, whilst recognizing that net zero from now will not pay down any of our carbon debt. And I'll try and conclude with some essential steps that we as researchers, thought leaders, and educators can take to make a difference. What we have is not a problem with the absence of carbon accounting, reporting, finance, or insurance. It's assurance, it's the opposite. Different carbon accounting techniques are, are, are springing up all over the place. I'm not arguing that there are too many or they're not well intentioned, just that many of them don't seem to lack, they seem to lack the sufficient understanding of either the underlying science or technology or the nature of decision context. And those tasks, those choosing between the different carbon accounting alternatives, lack the fundamental carbon literacy to make an informed choice, as do many of the users of these carbon calculations lack the insights and how to appropriate them into their models or meaningfully interpret the results. This is something that many researchers have been warning about for far too long. Even um, social environmental accountant scholars 
where I include myself, have not collectively stepped up to plate in sufficient numbers. The time for sitting back and observing and making kind of like well-intentioned cr criticisms, I think is running out. The factfulness of our climate emergency, how well, how, given the factfulness of our climate emergency, how well prepared are we to educate and advise others to provide meaningful evidence, costs, values, and projections to ensure that the optimum carbon technologies and solutions are given a fair chance of adoption? It's worth remembering that virtually every conventional accounting technique and most decision protocols are, are biased against solutions that can contribute to meeting the Paris Agreement targets and hopefully the more challenging goals to be sent in, in Glasgow this November. It's important to note that how to account for carbon is not prescribed, but it involves a series of important choices. And carbon accounting and related decisions are incredibly sensitive to these these choices. These choices include what protocol to measure, what type of how we define carbon, what entities we use, who we kind of like, how we're how we're calculating, how we're presenting the data, and how we're we're potentially valuing it. And as I mentioned before, many of these kind of accounting techniques, when they're used as their as their as per their specification, are providing evidence that's likely to increase rather than reduce carbon emissions. We're producing the wrong numbers for critical decisions, numbers that distort the decision outcome. Now this slide here is an attempt to try and make a little bit sense of some of these different, uh, these, these different techniques. What, what we're trying to do here is trying to, to array them, arrange them using two dimensions. The bottom, the kind of the, the, kind of the X axis is very much the logic of calculation talking about the distinction between attributional calculations and consequential calculations, building on the work by Brander and Bebbington and others. And then the kind of y-axis, if you like, is on the level of prescriptiveness, the extent to which these things have been institutionalized into other kind of like protocols, or the extent to which they are evolving and they allow massive amounts of kind of like discretion, and they're, they're effectively non-standardized. So if you like, in terms of the y-axis is we've got the bottom, we've got heavily standardized kind of like protocols and up to the top, we've actually got ones which there's, there is no, no, uh, no things. They're effectively custom made for each, each specific purpose. And, the, and, and this is if you like just a, a, a starting point on there. And we can start to see that they, they, they're not just different carbon accounting kind of practices, but actually they, they, they vary just, sort of like a, a kind of quite a fundamental level. I think maybe the, the, the real, one of the clarifications is that the notion of attributional and consequential logic. Um, attributional, what, what this means is that you measure carbon emissions as defined by a piece of, of regulation. So what you do is you, in, in advance, you have a piece of regulation, some kind of external kind of requirement and then what you then do is you then attribute the consequences, the carbon, carbon to this piece of regulation. So it's very much the way in which you say, okay, here are the national greenhouse gas accounts. Here are the categories that you have to have. You will then go and, and collect these for the prescribed entity of a nation using the appropriate kind of like methods there. It's important to realize that that is not the same as saying what are the carbon emissions of the nation? Because what we, what we have here is a carbon cost or a carbon value that's attributed to a piece of regulation. Whereas if we go right across the other side and we look at the consequential logic, what we do there is we start with a decision and the underlying reality of what happens to the carbon as a consequence of what goes on. And so therefore it's actually once more, once more based on the physical reality as measured by the science and modeled that's actually there, whereas the, and, it's, and it's triggered if you like by the decision that you're looking at, whereas the attributional is basically, are you complying with a piece of regulation? What's really important is that these two things are remarkably different. And, and this, this herein lies the kind of the basic, the basic 
the basic problem. And then we've also got, a, if you like, up the kind of the y-axis, we've got ones where we have protocols and we've one where we've got people are making things up, for example, things like counter account, which can be um, done by a kind of an NGO or an activist group to actually to kind of to challenge what's actually going on, looking at the consequences of a decision. And what we find is that when, we're, when people are talking about carbon, they ignore the fact that they've got different levels of prescriptiveness in the calculation of the number and that they have, have underlying different logics of calculation. And people are actually kind of conflating and confusing the figures that actually come out. All of these uh, carbon accounting produce useful information but they produce it for very different purposes. And it's back to the old fashioned classic accounting, different costs for different purposes, different decisions, different values. That message hasn't really got across to the, if you like, to the, um, <coughs> excuse me, to the, to the, to the kind of the, the different, uh, different aspects of, of, <coughs> of carbon accounting. I mean, it, it does, I mean, sorry, maybe sort of flip back. It does, does suggest that carbon emissions may be difficult to measure. And that is actually true, but actually we're not necessarily that bothered about getting exact definitions of the, of the kind of different things. We're actually looking at reducing carbon. The science is pretty clear. Every carbon molecule not emitted makes a difference. Once a molecule of carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere, it will affect, affect the climate for thousands of years. I mean, it's just a well, personal thing. It's sobering to think that my very first carbon emissions, which was one and a half mile trip from the Simpsons maternity pavilion to my kind of parents' house, a one and a half mile trip in a, my grandfather's Ford Anglia 105E is still contributing to global warming now and will do until 2262, okay? So yes, there may, be a, there may be a difficulty in trying to understand and measure the true carbon footprint, but that doesn't mean we cannot start using useful pieces of kind of carbon accounting to, to manage and take responsibility for the carbon emissions. Carbon emissions are already a cost and a liability to businesses and society and they're predicted to grow dramatically. But like so many sustainability risks, these costs are currently obscured in conventional accounting systems. There's a need, I think, for us to be collectively courageous and take actions in areas where the scientific understanding is still emerging, things like climate system tipping points. Because we all should know that the biggest risks come from where we're not looking and, we'll demand, and there's a demand for more proactive action until we've nailed down a carbon accounting standard, which I think is a problem. How likely is it that if IFRS will implement a carbon accounting standards before the polar ice caps disappear and rising sea levels has reclaimed millions of miles of coastline and we're running out of, of fresh water? We need to act now. Now let's, let's just look at a live project that, um, that we're kind of working on at uh, the University of Birmingham. And, it, and it's, about, it's called Net Zero Accounting for Net Zero UK. And it's funded by Research England. Um, and, and in many ways, this came from, we had this big, big announcement about the Net Zero, Net Zero strategy to convert um, into, into here. And here's the 10 point plan that's actually there. And there's lots of kind of really important kind of like issues and transitions. It's, it's an ambitious, systematic, sy sorry, systemic transition to a, a zero carbon nation and a net zero world. However, we had slight concerns about the ability to, of, of the evidence to start making the right decisions at these, these, act these actual points. So what we've been working on is looking at this, this 10 point net zero action plan mapping out the kind of like the decision characteristics and the critical decisions in this transformation, mapping the in evidence requirements would actually be required to kind of like to make these decisions kind of properly. Then mapping the carbon accounting tools and then looking at a kind of a tools to decision matrix, identifying gap analysis and solution specifications. And um, Let's just say it's, 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 it's not a kind of particularly encouraging thing. So largely what we have is we have 
a decent plan that's actually ambitious, but actually serious concerns about the underlying evidence that will actually be used and a concern that we're actually potentially using the wrong, the wrong things. Because what, what we tend to find is that often there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a kind of a research and experience suggests that this, this lovely kind of nice, clear, ordered map um, with a kind of a carbon accounting standard in the middle that is actually informing external reporting, capital market requirements, management accounting purposes, governance and regulations and taxation and assurance and certification, it comes from a coherent logical center point that we're at working on. And that means that we can then use the information in different, in different areas. So we can maybe use some of the external reporting. We can translate that to management accounting. It's used to inform kind of taxation. It's used to inform um, from that. But this is the kind of, this is very much the, if you like the, the kind of like the logical coherent utopia that's science driven and, and objective. And it allows data and evidence to be easily repurposed, translated in different contexts and adapted in different calculative spaces. And, and there is, sorry, I'm, I'm going to do a little, a little bit of education here because it's really, it's, it's difficult to kind of explain some of the problems without a little bit of there. And there, there, is, a, there is a standard that could provide this conceptual foundation for these different carbon calculative spaces. And this is the UN's Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which uses a very similar logic to accounting and shares many of the same desired attributes and covers the, if you like, the carbon life cycle mentioned earlier. And it, it, it kind of deals with, if you start over at the, at the kind of the, the left-hand side, we have supply chain, the carbon that's embedded in the purchase good, capital goods, fuel and energy, transport distribution is there. So we, we then, then the, a company then purchases these and then we, we have the embedded carbon that flows from, from other people into the kind of that company's accounts. Then we have scope two, which is about purchased energy, because energy is obviously one of the big drivers of carbon emission. So it actually has its separate, what's called scope. Then we have the things which the organization does itself in transforming resources or things into products and services. And then we then have the after sales. So after we've sold it, there's a carbon consequences from the actual sale. So if you, if you kind of like, uh, if you produce oil, Obviously, you've then got your oil rig, you've got your workers, you've got to ship people out, you've got to transport it to a refinery, you then do all the kind of the processing using energy, then you kind of sell it, then it gets transported to the customers who then maybe further process it, use it, dispose of it, and there's other kind of issues actually going on there. So we have this kind of this life cycle across these different scopes, okay? It also has, in, in many ways, it, it, it provides well, so it's, a, it's very much calculated. It very much provides, if you like, the, the grammar and language and logic of calculation, as well as detailed conversion factors that most of the kind of underlying kind of techniques do use. So at the core, there is this potential utopian device and many people feel that it's there. And however, the application, this is a protocol, but how it's actually applied is actually kind of surprisingly kind of different and involves very many different choices, in particular, the choice of what scopes to use. So we've got kind of four different scopes. And I suspect this will come as no surprise to anyone. When we actually did the kind of the mapping here, what we find is, is actually something a lot more messy, a seriously kind of like messy, very much a um, uh, a kind of a, if you take that kind of first one, there's an empty middle. There is no standard way of actually looking at it. When you look at the different carbon accounts that are actually produced for specific purposes, and I've just got some examples there, they, they often claim to be based on the, on the greenhouse gas protocol, but mostly through selective application and hybridization with other contextual factors. And what it means is that these choices are, are very much um, kind of black boxed as well. So it's very difficult to understand what's actually going on. And actually in particular to do with entity differences, um, some of them apply to products, some to companies, some to national or regional kind of variations, some relate to particular financial instruments. 
there's a range of different standards what's actually going on. So what we actually have is we have these, these techniques which are actually often unrelatable to each other. They lack translatability or meaningful commensuration. But what we're finding is evidence of misguided commensuration and inappropriate translation. So if you like, in our kind of the first kind of bit of this, this study is that we, we're, we're identifying high levels of problematic carbon accountability. And so, for example, an oil company can proudly and legitimately announce that they're going to become carbon neutral while omitting the carbon of the very fossil fuels they sell. Because it's possible, this is possible because an oil company does not need to account for the embedded carbon in its supply chain, its tankers, or the carbon footprint of its products in any net zero calculation. It can choose to if it wants, and many companies do, and therein lies the problem. Because there's many opportunities for zero carbon businesses to actually to kind of externalize by outsourcing and, and, and supply chain. <laughs> okay, so we maybe, do, if we maybe just kind of zero in on, on one of them, the capital markets, you know, the, the financial thing. What we're actually finding is a massive ca carbon market failure. The harsh reality is in the absence of meaningful carbon accounts, the markets have proved far better at serving the financial interest of companies and investors than coming anywhere near close to addressing climate change. Market, market led solutions were based on published carbon emission and mandatory disclosure of carbon based assets that would allow investors to allocate capital to these companies with the lowest carbon footprints. This way carbon could be priced in to valuations and encourage businesses to decarbonization. This trust in the wisdom of the market, the trust will, would eventually win through has been an abject failure. Because after 30 years, there are still a handful of highly valued oil corporations whose carbon assets alone would comfortably take the earth past its two degree global warming target if they were burned. And that evidence has been in their accounts for years, but the supposed efficient ra rationality of the market has failed to identify and eliminate these unsustainable carbon risks and its valuations, which could have incentivized the company to leave their oil and gas and coal in the ground. Responsible investors can play a vital role in 2020 series and Climate Action 100, who together represent invested more than $47 trillion in assets, demanded hundreds of the world's largest corporations disclose details of all their government lobbying and introduced a benchmark tracker to identify where their engagement and business models are not in line with net zero commit carbon commitments. The Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change promised to align their members $1.3 trillion of investment with the Paris uh, Agreement Accord on Climate Change. So there is pressure, but actually these are unusual. These are, these are, these are if you like, freaks of the market rather than the dominant practice. In many ways, there is a, a kind of a, a growing sense of urgency to compel companies to be more ambitious and committed in their climate targets or they risk being ostracized, face financial losses, legal penalties, penalties, and public censure. But this needs carbon accounting and accountability that's fit for all carbon reduction purposes. And I want to kind of to move on to demonstrate how these are not happening. Just a little aside, um, and a, a big thanks to Colin Day from University of Stirling for this and, and other moments of, of aspiration. It does seem that the carbon accounting techniques are, are remarkably adaptable. This is a very interesting kind of little paper from, I think it was um, from Stanford, um, where, where people actually have then looked at the climate impact of superheroes and actually worked out how much energy they would actually take to actually do things. The good things, if you're a Batman fan, Batman's not actually the worst, which, I, which came as a great relief to me, just in case they actually kind of stopped it. But the point is, is that when we think about things, when we actually apply the logic appropriately, particularly consequential logic, it's interesting, we can actually pull out really complicated um, kind of calculations in a, in a meaningful way. Now, what I, I want to, to talk about is dig a, dig a little bit deeper into uh, carbon accounting and particularly in relation to carbon disclosures. And I want to, to kind of talk about some work which I've done with uh, Stuart Cooper, um, at University of kind of Bristol. And what we did was we, we started to look at the 
the greenhouse gas reporting of the water and sewage companies in England and Wales from the period of their privatisation in 1989 through to 20, 2019, the whole kind of like period of actually there. There's a few reasons for picking, picking them. One is that they're a, a highly kind of like visible kind of um, corporate entity and um, kind of business, business there. They have a high level of dependency on environmental issues um, and particularly a dependency on the climate change. And so there, there was a kind of an, a number of really important issues. They also, as we'll I'll talk about later, is that they had regulatory kind of like changes in how they reported kind of climate change over, over this period. What we, what we did was we looked at the quantified carbon disclosures from any official company source, uh, annual report, web pages, CSR, official regulated returns, to see what carbon emission data was available for others to input into their decisions. But not just that, we looked at the usability of that data for different purposes. And that involved looking at, in depth at calculative practices and choices made in the, in the disclosure process. In addition, we explored their carbon reduction plans, strategies and, and projects, and what we call the carbon accountability, not just the carbon, carbon disclosures. Um, this project has gone on, I, I think, I mean, Stuart, we're, we're still working on it. We, we, we kind of like, <laughs> why have we not finished? Because what, what happened was this apparently simple project turned into like a, a bit of a, a, a series of complexly interconnected rabbit holes that we just kind of went down to try and make sense of it. And there was the two of us putting our head together and we know this subject and we know this sector and we really, really struggled and we're still struggling to make sense of the kind of the, of the data. But anyway, here are, here are the kind of like the highlights of, of this, this one here. As I mentioned, there was a, a, a natural experiment in this sector which attracted to us. So we can see that we've got um, three columns, voluntary reporting period. That was from um, 1989 to 2007, where there was no requirement, it was a free for all. It was just, you, you, you disclose, it was very kind of like voluntary no kind of like no no concerns in, in in terms of that one there a growing awareness of of kind of the climate change nothing really kind of happening then we from from 2008 to 2011 the regulator decided that the companies had to disclose climate change requirements it was part of their pricing it was part of their accountability and they laid down an incredibly prescriptive set of how do you measure it unique kind of like measurements, including best available science kind of like mechanisms in there for that kind of time period. Um, and to produce comparable kind of reliable data that was used for regulatory purposes. It'll come to no surprise of you with the more critical bent was realized that the, this made the water and shoes companies cry out with pain that they had to do these things and demanded that they then move into a um, <laughs> move into a, a kind of a risk reporting. So let the market decide what information was actually kind of required to actually be produced, which meant largely complying with um, general corporate reporting kind of requirements, which required a single carbon figure of some undisclosed kind of like purpose. So what we have is a situation where experimentation going on, tight regulation, and then a change in practice to actually to do things. What was really interesting is how it kind of changed over time. Even though the companies had developed specific expertise during the regulatory period, virtually none of them carried that forward. In fact, in, after that period, the, the amount of disclosure dropped. And look at the time scale, 2012, when the climate emergency was getting there, we've actually found that the water and sewage companies were choosing to produce less climate change, okay? And if we just look quickly look down some of the kind of issues, did we have disclosed uncertainty levels? Only in the kind of the period because it's required. What was interesting in the data reliable, they were talking about some of the figures were plus or minus 50%. They knew that they were uncertain. They knew there were problems. Yet after it, they didn't disclose any of this uncertainty. Consistent use of protocols? No, only in the June reporting period. Were they complete in, in, in all of them? No. Did they comply with the reporting regulations? Yes. 
Did they use comparable accounting entities? No, we found corporate, listed group, regulated corporate activities, regulated activities in this kind of same period. Often undisclosed, you had to find this out for yourself. Could, they, could you use them for any ranking of disclosure? No, you couldn't rank between them because of the differences in the practices, even within the June reporting period, because of the high levels of data uncertainty and lack of reliability. And remember, they just dropped that after the kind of the period. Was it possible to do any trend analysis? No, you couldn't do a trend analysis. You couldn't actually make sense of what's actually going on. And there was quite a lot of narrative disclosure, but that narrative disclosure was decoupled from the actual figures that were actually produced. Now, I'm going to this, um, just show a little bit of some of the kind of the, 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 the problems in this one. I, I, I tried this out in my son and he says this is a really horrible slide. Uh, and we tried for about three days to make it e easier to understand. But I'll, I'll, I'll just stick with me for here because I think it really illustrates what, what actually goes on. What I've got in this slide here is the columns along the top are the greenhouse gas protocols um, elements that that slide I showed, the scope, the scope three, the scope two, the scope one. Okay, then we have the rows are prod specific solutions that the water companies have, have disclosed in their accounts as their solution to the climate change problems. Okay, so the rows here are, are, are actually, and what I'm going to do is I'm now going to kind of like look at the different lenses. So if you look at this, these proposals through the different lenses of different aspects of the greenhouse gas protocol, to see what what you kind of what kind of things do you actually get, okay? So these ones here. So this is the this is what the would be included in any report, okay? So we can see that we have switching the renewable supplier, generating renewable energy, down to purchasing carbon offsets and bioremediation schemes. Bioremediation schemes. Just hold that in your mind because this is the gold standard solution that's required for kind of like net zero. And we can see that we have some of these proposals do not show any positive or negative carbon impacts in the reported carbon emissions, even though the water and sewage companies are putting these forwards as solution. So the low carbon procurement doesn't actually hit the reported carbon figures. If we unwind a little bit here, we have some kind of like some interesting things on. Now there's a, there's a couple of quirks to do with the water sector because they've got a regulator that they actually require them to calculate it differently. And, and because of the nature of the water and sewage company, because obviously water and sewage, if you, you know, kind of, if you know your water and sewage, know that they have a piped solution. So they suck the water out the ground. They own the water sources. They suck it out, they have ownership, they clean it, they distribute it, they then goes into a kind of say a domestic house. You have temporary ownership, normally for a split second, and it then goes back into the sewage system. So they actually then the, you know kind of dispose it. So one of the quirks of the water and sewage, com sewage companies is they actually include the transportation in their internal costs. This doesn't happen with any other sector other than the power sector, where they actually kind of like do it. So they have a, a bias against them because normally if you were selling bottled water, all of the things in blue would not be included as part of your carbon accounting. If you pipe it to the people, then it's included as part of your energy cost. So there's a kind of a distortion there. So it's, it's almost impossible to compare, if you like, the performance of a water and sewage company to another company because these other ones are actually doing it in terms of the gray numbers, whereas the water and sewage companies are actually accounting for their, their kind of carbon footprint on the blue ones. So we've already included some major characteristics that actually including after sales, end of life, which other companies can do. So you really can actually kind of do this. If you look at the other two, we then start to look at the supply chain, which is over here. And we can actually see that, if you like, in some of these ones, there's increases in carbon accounting, largely to do with you know, um, kind of capital energy equipment, which are not included in these figures here. 
So in a normal business, we would just be judging investing in low carbon tech on the gray arrows here. In the water and sewage, we're judging it based on the gray and the blue, but the increases fall outside the carbon calculation because we do not calculate, we don't actually kind of like do that. So we have that one there, but we also have some other ones here. These other two here, what we can actually see is we've actually got um, savings here, which are not included. So low carbon procurement in, and kind of low carbon commuting in this bit here have nothing, right? There's nothing going on here. So there's no measure of these two the kind of like really positive, positive attributes. They're not included. So the benefits are kind of like are, are not included. But guess what? We find that these types of these types of activities are not actually actually there. The other thing is, because we're talking a net zero, the greenhouse gas protocol doesn't do because it only includes um, positive figures. We have the ones at the end here, which relate to um, offsets. Now, offset is basically you do something and then you plant a tree or you do something to kind of to, to sort of fix it afterwards. Um, and, and this is an, an example here. Now, these are not including the greenhouse gas protocol. And so therefore we have these, these other issues there that if we purchase carbon offsets, if you like, it's, it's actually there. It doesn't, it's not included anywhere right now in the greenhouse gas protocol and none of it actually is included in the calculated emission. Bioremediation schemes, nature-based solutions, actually kind of go in call. This, there's, there's a number of ones where, where the, you know, the kind of the venerable David Attenborough has praised the water companies for doing some amazing stuff, effectively re-establishing wetlands to actually to, to do these things. It's really seen as a really powerful way to have nature-based solutions to take carbon out of the atmosphere. They don't appear anywhere in this in this one here, and you're going to have to. They're they're effectively having to make their own carbon accounting kind of calculations. So apologies for sort of like <laughs> I mean, a slightly kind of complicated thing, but what you see is is remembering that the the gaze the rep, the public gaze of the grey columns. These other columns here are the carbon footprint. And we can see the distorted kind of like value of what's actually going on. And that's why one of the things we basically say in this paper is that you can't use these disclosed figures for decision making purposes. Okay, so even though they complied with all the relevant regulatory requirements, it's not possible to evaluate the reported greenhouse gas emissions over time or between SEGs. That within specific regulatory regimes, there was a possibility of more consistent comparable data of regulated activities. However, the quality of the data was such that you couldn't actually use it in any meaningful way, had limited use outside regulatory compliance, but it was very good for regulatory compliance monitoring. That's what it's designed for. That the carbon calculative choices are salient and material to the kind of to, to both what the figures that are produced and how they're interpreted. What we kind of like call is the attributional logic of international treaty compliance is not relevant to business decisions. When we track back, so why are they just focusing on scope one and scope two? That's because that's what's required by the nation. So the country, the nation, the, that that is what they're kind of like required to account for. <laughs> but that doesn't apply to this. So what we're as Gunn is saying, this is what we're this is what we as a country are required to do. So let's get our com our companies to see us the same figures. But actually, it's it's not relevant because what we really need is full life cycle consequential logic type calculations to make any meaningful things. If we don't have, we have serious problems. If you just think back to that previous slide and you were just making a decision on the grey, you'd actually be making the wrong decisions. Um, in the air. So, um, I, I, th I, th I think it's kind of, a, it's it's useful there then to kind of to move on just to try and kind of like a, a little bit um, thinking this. If you kind of imagine, and this is a kind of, people are trying to get around the problem, because one of the problems is the greenhouse gas emissions are invisible, we can't see them, to try and visualize it. 
And so if you can imagine every raw material product service a business bought came with its own balloon of green of, of full of greenhouse gas as well as a price tag. Then every process use of energy resource consumed day stored or distant transported involved in acquiring them further inflates the balloons as more greenhouse gas are produced which are attached to the final product. The customer inherits these balloons and then through use consumption or disposal further inflates them until they actually go on. So really just the sort of two premises is that just with cost, businesses uh, do need to know the size of their carbon balloons, of anything they buy, do, and how much bigger they will inflate before they're sold on. Climate change won't be solved by passing on these balloons with whoever's holding them when the music stops subject to all liabilities, because emissions are out there for 3,000 years, okay? At least, at least half of it. So while it's true a business can deny legal responsibility for that balloon after sale, it's more difficult to deny moral, reliable, moral responsibility or avoid reputational damage. And in the future, smaller carbon balloons will be a source of value as, um, if you like, emissions become increasingly monetized and, and kind of like an, an, an unacceptable. Now, how, what, one of the things that kind of that, if you like, comes out from, from this, the, this other, the, I want to talk about another piece of work now, where we looked at kind of, we're looking at this kind of the big picture of this transition. We then looked at kind of like reporting in a situation. And now instead of doing some work on how do we, how do we take these, these things and actually manage it at, at a more transactional level? And so I, I can briefly kind of overview a, a, a kind of product we're working with, um, with kind of colleague, um, kind of Nana. And this is a qualitative research project where what we did was we interviewed key stakeholders in the electric vehicle value chain, which you'll see is one of the key components of the, of the kind of net zero transition. And we worked backwards from sellers to financiers, to transport planners, to manufacturers, to component manufacturers, to representatives of the extractive industries in, de in developing countries. So we tried to map the whole supply to get a sense of how we would do a full life cycle greenhouse gas consequential analysis on something like um, a car to get us to, to how we could patch together different accounts. Uh, and, and we actually kind of like worked out that it's possible to actually to do something in, you know, material flow analysis, greenhouse gas protocol, blockchain. So I'll, I'll be kind of checking out that di distributed ledger, sustainable development goals, material accounting practices, cost accounting practices, international standards, where we can actually create a circular economy, which actually is kind of the basis of much decarbonization. Um, and this, this process is, is there. Now, what, what we kind of find is a, is a different is that, is that we, to try and decarbonize or get a net zero world, but we need to do something quite different. What we need to do is we need to start to look at the, at the every, dis, rather than saying it's a corporate car, carbon footprint, no, it's actually, it's about the granular transactions that businesses are making where the difference will actually have in terms of the whole kind of value chain. Um, what you buy, where you ship it, what you invest in, how you heat your building, how energy efficient, how much you waste, how you design your product, how you make it, sell it, ship it, how your employees get to work, how you store it, how do you move things around, how do you finance it, how and where do you sell your product and what do people do with your product? Because the carbon emissions are consequences of these decisions, not necessarily an investment decision in, in a corporation. Because if you want to reduce it, this is what you've actually got to do. So in procurement decisions, it's important to think about what inflates a carbon balloon of anything you're planning to buy and sell. Think about what they've done to transform the thing from its origin when it was ripped out the kind of the planet to actually the thing that turns up at your warehouse shop or, fa or, or factory floor. The distance and mode of transportation, energy used in processing, raw materials used in intermediate. These are all carbon balloon inflators and different suppliers and different materials have different carbon balloons. A mine that uses solar panels for, for kind of like pumping out stuff will have a lower carbon balloon than one that uses diesel. But that advantage may be lost if they then air freight it from the other side of the world. 
And if, if materials are delivered in kind of carb and re returnable cables and containers, they will come with a smaller carbon balloon than if they're, they're packaged in single use plastic and they require less work to unwrap, store or dispose of. So there's lots of simple actions that businesses can take. And it's actually about trying to look at things at that level as well, and um, to try and kind of like what, what actually sort of like what actually goes on. And that can involve innovative design. And this is one of the things that we we kind of like comes out from this study here was about and very much was it identified the electric battery and the design of the battery and particularly the recyclability of it. That was the biggest, the biggest thing. And what, what was actually is about the design becomes important. It's not that electric vehicles are, are they better or worse than, than uh, conventionally kind of like fueled engines? They are. It's just that they can be so much better. You can really kind of make a difference in what actually goes on. And one of the things which, which came out was the electric battery. I didn't know this. Uh, a car electric, ba uh, electric battery actually is, is, is no longer is seen as, as wasted when it only works at 80% efficiency. So 80% of it there, and often it's just thrown away. Whereas actually, if you have a second life and you try and design the battery to be recycled, reused, or have a second life, it means that you get multiple uses for the same amount of kind of like carbon. So for example, old car batteries can be used as storage for domestic solar panels. And, and I've been successfully running small villages uh, in developing countries from solar, solar panels as well, effectively for free. So there's a lot of kind of issues to, to actually do, and, and it's about trying to develop this kind of, in some ways, this carbon literacy um, at a kind of a particular, particular kind of point in time. However, when sorry, we look at- electric... Sorry, can I just interrupt? Um, I'm just conscious of the time and I want to leave some space for people to ask some questions and stuff. So okay. do you think you can- uh... I'll batter on, a, I'll, I'll, I'll finish in five, I'll finish in about five minutes. Yeah, perfect, thanks. Okay. Um, this is a here, so we have all that stuff going on there. And when you actually go to buy an electric car, that's the information you get, the use of the product there. So people are, are buying an electric car based on the carbon emissions of one of the 24 different components. So in some ways we got um, a, a range of different ways in which we, we have to do things. It's important, I think, to recognize that something called net carbon or carbon zero is not doesn't mean anything other outside international treaty obligations. It is purely defined by it's a, it's a choice that actually kind of like um, that actually kind of like people make, and also it tends to uh, miss out things like um, carbon justice because in many ways uh, part of the climate change um, issue is there. So, so for example, the world's richest or res richest individuals, 10% are responsible for half of the car all carbon emissions through their consumption. Whereas the poorest 50% only um, produce 10% of what's actually going on. So there's, a, there's an in inequality in what's actually going on. So here's a, um, just some, we need to do something. And, and one of the things we're doing at uh, Birmingham Business School in the accounting and accounting department is we're actually kind of like um, uh, a project to try and prepare our students for net zero carbon accountability for their net zero carbon future. It's coordinated by Madeline, Annika and Tom. Um, and what we're, what we're doing, and, and we're pretty much, we're, we're almost there, is we want to be the first accounting department in the world to include climate change in every single module. And, and relevant climate change reading material, lecture, tutorial, and assessment. So taxation, climate tax, assurance, climate kind of assurance, reporting, management accounting, data analysis, analytics, critical stuff like that. And we want to try and turn that into a carbon accountability kind of pack and, and a MOOC at some, some kind of point in time. Um, I was really surprised that we are, we are, <laughs> we will be the first in the world, which, which is uh, very strange. There's another thing which uh, in our project has brought people's attention. Um, the CSER um, is, we are having a, we've got funding from the Royal Society of Edinburgh for, in support of COP26 to do a global carbon lit literacy an accounting survey 
of institutions and stuff like that. So that's that will be kind of we're designing that just now. That's another kind of project that's there. So anyway, qu very quickly, some actions that we want to do. We need to build. You need. We need to build our domain knowledge. There's a wonderful kind of um, starter uh, a, a chapter, um, Carbon, by Rob Charnock, Matt Brander, and Tom Schneider, in a kind of wonderful, wonderful new uh, Routledge Handbook on Environmental Accounting that's just out today from all your best libraries and and go and and, and do that. The, if you're really interested in one start, the Mark Carney's Wreath Lectures are available, are, are very, very good and, and powerful. And, and Mark Carney, um, ex, um, governor of the Bank of England, is kind of leading the UK um, kind of COP26 team that actually kind of going in. So it's they're well worth a, a good look. I'd ask people to participate in the Global Carbon Literary Survey. If anyone's interested in, in joining us at Birmingham in our education project by creating and sharing educational materials, more than love people to kind of to get in touch and actually do them. We want to try and create a, a kind of a common uh, literature resource. So including working papers so we can actually share things. Find out what your university is doing on COP26 and climate change. Join in or get them to do something. There's a lot of stuff going on right now there's really good interdisciplinary potential. Find out what your professional accounting association is doing, join in or get them to do some. Most of them are actually doing stuff and, and actually doing some really interesting work. Another thing which I find really useful is to find out projects in your local area and join in. Um, what certainly in um, business in the community, I'm working with them on halving West Midlands carbon footprint. Um, I'm kind of working with a really, really kind of nice um, uh, NGO Carbon Copy, which are looking at local community-based uh, low carbon emissions. Uh, one of the slides uh, link are up there. And, and SEMA, we're doing some work with SEMA, um, that they're actually doing quite a lot of stuff. Research any of the topics mentioned. There's so much research needs to be done, right? There's a huge lack of, lack of kind of evidence. I, I was lucky enough to be asked to be a, an expert reviewer on the IPCC next coming kind of review. The biggest finding is we don't know stuff and we need to find out. Is that, it, that's the, the big finding. Um, maybe even a VAFA special interest group on climate change and finance um, and actually try and build carbon accountability kind of um, um, thing. I'll just kind of finish, finish, kind of, um, finish kind of now. There's many other things we could do. A lot of these problems come from an out of sight, out of mind attitude to greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are largely invisible and their source is often impossible to prove. The trouble is there's no such thing as throwing away carbon. It all has to go somewhere. Nature-based solutions, carbon sinks, forests, peat bogs, marine kind of like plankton, um, kind of coral reefs all need to be enhanced and protected. The solutions to climate change need less carbon in the atmosphere, but it also needs carbon taken out. If you imagine our atmosphere as an overflowing bath with both taps running and the plug in, turning down one tap makes it a little bit less bad, but it's still a problem. Switching off a tap altogether, it's a little bit bad. Switch off both tap, it stops it getting worse and allows us to mop up a bit of the mess, but the bath is still spool, still too full. We need to pull the plug and start draining the bath to the right level. That's what we need to do right now. However, there's a wee little twist there. We can't let the bath run dry because we need some global warming or we become Mars or Venus or Jupiter or stuff like that. This is the problem. We need some stuff there, but not that much. It's a classic Goldilocks um, kind of solution. Not too hot, not too cold. We need to get the balance right and that's the problem. Any solution that doesn't tackle climate change holistically at a systemic level only passes the problem somewhere else along the chain or onto our children. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Ian, for that. If people want to applaud either uh, through your cameras or uh, the reactions button at the bottom of the, uh, the screen. Uh, we do have some time for any uh, questions. I would uh, say, uh, ask people to go for questions rather than comments. Uh, I'm sure Ian is perfectly uh, happy to take comments by email or maybe if you do have time in the cafeteria afterwards. Um, so if we have any questions, if people can, if colleagues can raise their hands, either use the raise the hand function through the participants 
right? Mm -hmm. Or um, you can, if you're on screen, you can wave at me and I'll try to catch your eye. Yes, uh, chat in. Right, thank you very much, Stuart. Wonderful uh, research insights, uh, Professor Ian, really learned a lot. One question, we talk about greenhouse gas effect and pollution emitting or carbon emitting. Many countries are trying to compete with each other. Which country is uh, worse in pollution? Which country is better in terms of uh, protecting environment? Having said this, uh, many countries are actually outsourcing their production activity to different countries. So for example, Dell Computer, which is a USA company, outsourcing their manufacturing base in China and emitting pollution in carbon, which country you consider as the one who's emitting pollution? Um, well, it's, it's, it's actually both. And I, I think one of, the, one, of, one of the real tensions we have in, in, in this is that we have what's called a, a production basis for doing the carbon emissions and a consumption basis. Um, and so what we what we need to do is we need to um, monitor and if, if you monitor and reg if you monitor and regulate the production, that will actually reduce the consumption of fully agree. Oh, there. However, it does it then places a responsibility in a particular kind of like a geographic nation, in which falls part of them. So there's a, there's a sense of politics, but. What we actually need to do is we need we need both. There's there's been a, a movement in the carbon accounting to have a single silver bullet type number that can actually be used, but it's not. It's for different purposes. We have compliance. So it's quite clear with com compliance for against the production of things which a company's response a country is responsible for. You could argue that the the China has responsibility to sure. control their their kind of like the industries in their country but we also have to then to put that onto the onto the consumer and actually the, the kind of the person who's actually doing it so they need to have everybody needs to have responsibility it's not just about one person having it and the way the debate's been going as long as this carbon utopia type stuff is that's we just we just we just count it once and then we do it it's not it's multiple different decisions there's, a, there's not a single person responsible for it. There's multiple people responsible for it. And how do we design carbon accountability? That's why I tried, that's why I'm kind of talking about carbon accountability in a way that shares the collective responsibility to ensure that we get collective and collaborative um, action. That's great. great. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, you. Yes, Dermot, you had your hand up. Do you want to unmute and ask a question of Ian? Yes, uh, great. That, very stimulating, Ian. Um, I'd like to follow up on much of what you suggest, so I hope I can get copies of your material. Um, I'm happy uh, to just uh, get the slides. I don't know how you do A that. slightly uh, picky question about your carbon balloon, which I liked very much. Yeah. So how far do we go back? If you think of a product, do you start from the emissions from today onwards, or a specific date, or when its raw materials were mined, or what about the machinery used for the mining? And then of course, there's the human capital as well. Um, I'm sure that you're going to be introducing carbon accounting to your Birmingham Business School. We're so, right, <laughs> right, so thinking about the uh, human capital of Ian Thompson, I like the way you uh, talked about your emissions in being driven from the hospital in your dad's Ford Anglia. Yeah. But what about the, uh, the carbon involved in, in the hospital where you were born? And the, you know, everything that went into creating um, Ian Thompson and perhaps your parents too. No, absolutely. Well, that's my question. Absolutely. Well, I think what, what what I think is important is that we've got to, in terms of, um, this is where there's different purposes. So there's getting rid of the historic carbon emissions 
Um, and, and what do we then, how do we then kind of like embark, embark upon that? So I, th I think it, I, I tend to use a kind of, in some ways, like a, where, where are the key decisions? Where, where are the kind of the inflection points that we actually kind of want to, do, want to go? Um, so in, in some ways it's about, I, I think you should, I think it's, it's interesting if you look at the kind of the car, car manufacturer, what they're trying to do is trying to use something like, um, like blockchain to capture the carbon and air pollution and toxicity and injustice and slavery and stuff like that from the actual, the, the, the most granular level possible and find a way that then pulls it through the kind of the, the supply chain um, and, and, and work, it out, work it out that way. So that's, I think that that's kind of, that's critical in terms of, of that type of decision. So I, th I think if, if you, uh, the analogy I would use is looking at something like uh, quality management. That was enacted not through the capital markets, but through the procurement chain by attaching responsibility on the, on the purchaser as well as there, because largely they tend to be more affluent. So you've basically put the pressure on the people who have potentially the most resources to actually to do then. Um, in terms of how do we deal how do we deal with uh, carbon that's in the in the atmosphere? I think there's some logic in going back and saying who caused it, but actually there's possibly far better to do a more kind of collective. How do we get carbon out? How how can we actually reforest? How can we how can we enable? And it's largely going to have to be nature based solutions. So how can we find ways to incentivize that? And, and perhaps one of the ways to incentivize that is through some form of economic trans, trans, transaction, but we then see who pays for it, the people who have this kind of responsibility um, for it. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. I, I think that what they are, are, are there many different questions in the exact same way if we say we're going to clean up pollution, we're going to kind of like transform a, a sector. We need to break it down into critical decisions work out what the appropriate kind of like measure is there and how we do it. And just, just so we know, my carbon footprint today is sitting about 500, 500 tons and, and is likely to be 800, 800 tons by the time I die. And so I, I kind of have a rough idea on the type of offsetting and mitigation that I kind of, that I, that I kind of need to do. But in many ways, you can only change from now, but changing from now um, without a dealing with the debt is, is kind of critical. Because what we have now is, is net zero from now doesn't pay off any debt. That's my real concern. We all these businesses are going, we're going net zero from now, right? That's just leaving it. Can you imagine doing that in, a, in like in a financial transaction where you just suddenly go, oh, by the way, uh, hello bank, I've decided that I'm going to go um, kind of, net paying off my debt from now. I'm not going to be any indebtedness. So can you just write off all that other stuff that I've actually done? You know, somebody needs to challenge businesses. And that's where I think some of the counter accounting um, that's actually going on about consequential stuff, where people are challenging business to say, no, you're not net zero. You're, net ze you're partially net zero from now. And by the way, you're making things worse. You know, that's a, that's a kind of discourse that we actually really need to have and we can get the evidence to actually produce it. I'm sorry, it's a much bigger question, Dermot. <laughs> so I don't know if it, this, Stuart wants to pull in another, another question. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I was looking at the time and we do actually have another couple of questions, but I think given the time that we're at, uh, I'm going to wind up the session here. Uh, sorry to, to Mark and to Suman. Uh, um, but I'm sure that Ian would be perfectly happy to, to respond uh, to any email questions, etc. as well. Uh, I just wanted to um, take this opportunity just to, to make um, uh, a couple of announcements because this is the last time we're, we're all going to be together actually at the, uh, at the conference. Uh, do please use the cafeteria over the next half an hour or so in the run up to the uh, the next set of sessions and there are SIG meetings and uh, some panel discussions that are happening and starting at half past three that I encourage members to go along and, and support 
uh, you can see the uh, on from the program drop down menu on the site uh, what's available at that time. Um, uh, first of all, any event like this, and Ian kind of alluded to this at the beginning, uh, requires a huge amount of uh, of organisation, and a lot of people have been involved with this uh, in advance. And I think one person that myself and Tevin in particular would like to. Uh, single out is uh, Tracy Sharrock, our administrator. The um, the site that we've been running this conference on, Tracy built from scratch. All right, this is not. We we looked in the marketplace for a number of different uh, alternatives. Some colleagues on the on the on this call will have actually been guinea pigs on some of the off the shelf ones. None of them really worked for us. Uh, so Tracy set about actually doing it all, all herself, and I think she's done an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, uh, of building the site. Um, I also wanted to thank all the chairpersons uh, over the course of the three days uh, for giving up their time, for coming along to keeping the conference moving, uh, for making sure that the presentations were on time and everybody got a chance to speak. And of course, the chairpersons will have interacted with a group of volunteers that we had for both for the uh, doctoral masterclass and also for uh, the conference over the last couple of days. Um, uh, and they have been uh, crucial in terms of ensuring access and identifying if we did have any uh, problems with any of Zoom calls, identifying them early enough that we could intervene and try to keep things uh, on track. Uh, and then finally, of course, I wanted to thank uh, all the presenters because without people putting in their papers uh, and wanting to come along to Baffin and actually present at the conference, uh, there would be no conference. Uh, so thank you all very much for all the presentations and for supporting BAFA um, uh, and um, for everybody over the last couple of days for the, the work that's been done to keep the conference going. So uh, mm -hmm. that's it really for me at, the, um, at this stage. Uh, please do go and enjoy the cafeteria and uh, hopefully I'll see some of you in about half an hour's time in, in uh, one or other of the panel discussions. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody.